Welcome back to a new episode of Beyond the Patterns. So today I have the great pleasure to announce Heidi Christiansen. She is a senior lecturer or associate professor, you could say, in computer science at the University of Sheffield in the United Kingdom. Her research interests are the application of AI-based voice technologies to healthcare. In particular, the detection and monitoring of people's physical and mental state introducing verbal and nonverbal traits for the expression of emotion, anxiety, depression and neurodegenerative conditions like in the case of therapeutic or diagnostic settings. So. I'm very excited to present this talk here today because the presentation that she's given has also been partially already a part of a survey talk at Interspeech. So if you are not in the field or like me have been missing the latest progress in the field for almost 10 years, then this is the presentation really to have a look at because you will really get an excellent introduction into the field. So the Presentation is entitled Automatic Processing of Pathological Speech, Recent Work and Ongoing Challenges. Heidi, great to have you here and the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Andreas. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I know you visited Sheffield recently and I couldn't be there, so uh, I'm glad to be able to see you a little bit uh, here in person. So as you explained, I'm going to talk about automatic processing of pathological speech. Um, I thought it might be useful to just start by um, explaining whereabouts uh, I'm sitting. So I gave uh, a similar talk recently to uh, John Hopkins University in the US, and I thought possibly they don't know where Sheffield is, but I'm guessing there's a few more people who know where Sheffield is. So it's sort of more or less in the middle of England, close to Manchester, um, an old industrial town, uh, but with a lovely university now and lots of modern, modern buildings. And we have a beautiful um, national park just out to the west. So if you have an opportunity, do come and, and visit us. So I'm going to talk about um, processing of pathological speech and some of the work we've been doing in Sheffield. So I'm just going to close my window because we seem to have some uh, work happening just in a quarter. Um, so pathological speech uh, in general is defined as a communication disorder where your normal or typical speech, as I prefer to call it, is disrupted. I've mostly worked with people who have um, cerebral palsy who've had a stroke or who have cognitive impairments. I'll talk a little bit about each of these uh, following on. Um, I think it's useful to start by just thinking about, uh, given we're sort of engineers and computer scientists, what is it we believe automation can contribute? So it very often makes tasks faster and cheaper and more repeatable, more objective. And I think that's all of those are really, if you like, selling points um, for our work. Um, I think it's also important to remind everyone we work with, doctors, et cetera, that computers complement the analysis that uh, humans tend to do in routine care. So we're not in the business of replacing doctors, um, which, of course, is often a worry. Um, instead, we're sort of um, hoping to augment the healthcare provision that is happening. So certainly in the UK, um, there is constantly a lack of funding to the National Health Service. And so um, doctors are not seeing patients as much as they would like and often they have to spend the time they see them on kind of routine tasks that were perhaps some of the automation we could help so they could pro provide some of the data beforehand. So some of the typical poor causes of pathological speech, um, as I mentioned, so cerebral palsy, stroke and dementia uh, or other neurodegenerative conditions. I won't go through this table in detail, but it's sort of just helping us to think about um, the impact of these different things and what it means for a person to uh, be living with these various conditions um, and how it is we as technologists can help in there. So take something like cerebral palsy. Uh, you would typically have this from birth. So it's, it's a, a condition that occurs because of birth um, complications. And so it means for that person, they are affected and impaired by life. You can't be cured. Um, often quite severely, so you might have severe mobility problems, spasms, sitting in a wheelchair, et cetera. 
And of course, this affects your ability to speak uh, as well. So your speech will often be very difficult to understand by people who are not used to uh, speaking with you. Um, contrast this with something like stroke, which is an abrupt thing or a brain injury, for example, from an accident. Um, so you might be living a perfectly normal, happy life and suddenly um, this occurs to you. So the impact is uh, catastrophic. Um, and that's a long series of um, therapy afterwards and rehabilitation. And again, this is perhaps an area where we um, can provide interventions and, and various um, things that could help that person just cope a little bit better with what has happened to their life. And then again, a sort of third thing um, is a dementia or neurodegenerative conditions. So they typically have a very slow onset. I'll talk a little bit about this later on, but dementia can typically be detected maybe up to a decade before you're diagnosed. Um, Parkinson's disease is another area. Um, so you very slowly get used to this um, uh, along with the family around you. Um, most of them are not curable either. Um, so once you have the diagnosis, again, there's a lot of anxiety around this and uncertainty and this kind of sets, sense of dread that things will get worse. So in the last column here, I've sort of outlined lots of different areas where we uh, can imagine speech technology might make a difference. So dictation, of course, um, communication aids in general, various spoken language interfaces just in general to your phones, to your homes. So areas where we are now, as typical speakers, all completely used to um, using our, our um, voice and our speech to engage with uh, devices and machines much more than even just a decade ago. Uh, I mentioned therapy and rehabilitation, again, assessing how severe a condition is, for example, is a, it's a huge area of interest and, and trying to help you improve things with speech therapy. Um, intelligibility assessment, again, um, I think is, is a major area of, of research. And in general, kind of detection of pathology and, and trying to find out when, for example, you might have uh, Parkinson's. So I've got two elements to my talk. So actually, um, because I talked a lot about um, atypical speech recognition in, at InSpeech, I've kind of cut that down a bit, um, that part down a little bit. So I will be talking more about the other side of my research here. Um, so it's not to bore the people who <laughs> sat through my InSpeech talk, um, but that's available. Uh, I, I believe that's recorded, so you can definitely access that. Um, so improving communication ability for people with atypical speech is, is the first half. And then the other uh, side of my research is detecting signs of pathology in a person's speech and language. So this is mainly working with uh, people with memory complaints that might be due to dementia. So I'm going to play this video for you. Hopefully you can hear this. Well, well. And you listen to me. I want to tell you how I can be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you understand what I just said? Um, it's easier for me to talk than it is to So the idea was to get an answer that we can talk to instead of typing it into. So hopefully you could hear that. Um, so John here is uh, one of our long-term uh, collaborators and users in Sheffield. He's got cerebral palsy, so he's been affected um, since birth. And this is John speaking at his uh, most articulate. So he's speaking slower than he would if he was speaking to me or certainly to his family members. Um, and he's really trying to articulate everything. Um, but I would think uh, most people would find it quite difficult to understand what he's saying. I certainly struggle uh, often. And so I'm going to play the clip again, but with the captions. And you'll see that he is producing all of the words. It's just really difficult for us to kind of latch on to the sort of segmentation in the speech. Um, it's easier for me to talk than so the idea was to get an answer that we can go to instead of typing it into. 
So there's a couple of things to notice here. One is that speaking for someone like John is a bit of a whole body experience. So it's a much more effort to speak. Um, another thing is that, as I said, he, is, um, he doesn't have any language production uh, problems. In general, he hasn't got any cognitive problems. It's just in the way that he's um, managing to articulate the speech. And so this is um, good news for machine learning in that the words are being said that just said slightly differently that we as humans would expect and certainly um, differently to what a typical ASR um, would be expecting. So this slide is just to kind of outline some of the key differences between disordered or, or atypical speech uh, and speech tick, um, recognition. So on the right here is a graph from um, an interesting paper back um, in, I can actually put the year on here, but I think it's um, probably 10 years ago now. So at the top, you'll see um, a sort of viral space for a dysarthric uh, male speaker and uh, below that, a non-dysarthric male speaker. And you can see the rings are much broader for the dysarthric speakers. So these are just the first two formats um, and they're also overlapping a lot more. So we can see from a machine learning perspective, this is trouble in terms of speech recognition um, being able to train really sort of um, focused models. Um, there's a lot more variability between the dysarthric and non-dysarthric person, but also within the dysarthric male. So even if you had a lot of speech from the same person, they would be much more um, variant in the way they are managing to articulate. And again, that means it's very difficult to, to train models that are as high performing. Um, so the main sort of research challenges when working in this space is really how we build uh, well-performing speech recognizers from very sparse data. Because every speaker is so different, um, we need a lot of speech from just that person. We can't assume that we could train a sort of general multipurpose model from a, a large pool of speakers and just apply it to someone like John. So that, uh, of course, is how... Um, the, the big um, speech recognition modules these days work. They just have a lot of speech. They've never necessarily seen speech from you. Um, so we really need speech from that particular person to, that we are trying to build a speech recognizer for. But of course, for each individual, it's very tiring to record many hours of data. You can see from someone like John, it's, um, you don't just ask him to read four hours of data. Another thing that's really difficult then uh, but required for speech recognition is that we get transcriptions. Um, so basically um, the written um, transcript of, of what words have been said. And the reason this is difficult is of course that it's really difficult to hear uh, what he said. So you'd need a family members, member to kind of do this. Um, and thirdly, there's kind of hardly any found data. So a lot of the early speech recognition uh, efforts in mainstream ASR would of course use many different databases, TV, broadcasts, YouTube, TED Talks, all of that kind of stuff. There's practically no data that would help us build a model for someone like John. And so confounding this is this very high need for personalization. So speaker independent models, as I said, do not generally work well. And so we can't assume that we can pull data from other speakers with dysarthry. So there are a couple of databases with um, speech from dysarthric speakers. Um, maybe 15 um, different speakers in a database, but you won't necessarily build a stronger model by pooling them all together. Um, so again, this is different from how we would go about things in, in mainstream ASR. And so um, I like to put up this um, graph, which is from um, Roger Moore, my colleagues, um, talking a couple of years ago. So he sort of lined, um, outlined this sort of timeline of typical mainstream ASR speech recognition starting back in the 1970s uh, with simple command and control systems and then walking all the way through to now being close to being able to have an, a decent perhaps conversation with a robot or virtual agent. Um, and if you think about where dysarthric ASR is, it is um, right up here. I think just in recent year maybe there has been a little bit of progress so definitely the google's project the euphonia claim to be sort of a little bit closer to being able to do a phrase-based um, asr and i've got a student as well who is uh, writing up and she's also um, developed systems that um, works well of course these are limited to the amount of data available so google has a, a major um, data collection effort that unfortunately they're probably not going to make um, available to um, people outside of Google. Um, and so it means that um, the rest of us are a little bit restricted in, in what we can do there. 
So I thought it might be useful to just outline how far we've come, what are the key things that seems to be making a difference in this space. So a lot of early work focused on, on sort of applying the obvious tool used for mainstream ASR improvements. So I worked early on with uh, Professor Thomas Hain, um, whom you might know here in Sheffield, and, and his initial thought was, let's let's just ignore the fact that this is disaster speech, let's just apply machine learning tools, which um, for those of you who know him will kind of um, see where he's coming from there. And that did work um, to a good degree. So uh, all of the usual things like model adaptation, et cetera, back then uh, did work. Um, but there's only so far um, you can get with that. So you had to think about more specific things. So we would normally just do model adaptation, for example, on the acoustic model or perhaps on the language model. But I did some work as well on pronunciation to try and really tune the dictionary to the pronunciations of the particular speaker. Again, some progress could be made, but it's not... A lot of the ideas in this area can be difficult to, to really get to work. So, for example, if you start messing with the dictionary, um, you may introduce more, more errors as well. So it's not um, straightforward to get to work. Of course, we know for mainstream, increasing the amount of data we have available um, will help. Um, so, again, people looked at porting some of the things that were being developed in the mainstream. So use of out main data is an obvious one, trying to build um, good quality models. So these days, for example, a Libra speech general model and then using transfer learning to move it into the space of this South Africa speech. Data augmentation is another area we've done a lot of work on. Um, permutations, etc. for example, in, in space. Uh, time, sorry. Um, people have also done some work on modifying the speech and the idea here is to um, try and modify the dysarthric speech so it sounds a bit more like typical speech and the hope is then that you might then be able to use the mainstream uh, ASR models here. Again, with mild dysarthric speech, this is possible. So we did uh, some work on trying to um, remove prolongations in a speech. So that's one of the, the big problems with uh, people with dysarthria. They'll sort of spend longer maybe um, on each vowel before they sort of get the articulators ready for the next um, setting, if you like. Uh, another thing that is typical is sort of false starts and repetitions and trying to remove some of that. Again, uh, these are things that do not necessarily trip up the human brain so much, but are pretty disastrous for uh, ASR. That would sort of normally require whole word um, uh, words. Um, there's also been quite a lot of work recently on trying to find best encodings and features and, and sort of sources of information. So an obvious one is to use articulatory data. So this was an idea that was visited um, quite a few years ago now for mainstream ASR. And the idea is very neat that you have this um, physiological um, system, of course, that's producing the acoustics. And if you could model that rather than these sort of slightly noisy and messy acoustics, you might be in a better space. Uh, but you immediately run into the problem you always run into when you're working with sensors that a lot of the work really is spent on cleaning up the sensory uh, data that you are the measurements. Um, but this is now being revisited again in the space of um, people with dysar 3 Again, we've shown some improvements here. Um, people still haven't worked out quite how to have non-noisy data. Um, and that's particular um, issues around articulatory data for people with dysarthria. One of them being that um, people with dysarthria do not necessarily have symmetric use of their articulators. So for example, if you watch people's tongues, it's moving not in a symmetric way as you would see with typical speakers, but uh, in a much more different way. So they might have better control of one side than the other. So again, some of the models really have to take this into account. I have yet to see actually people who, who does this well. Video has also been used as some of the recent work that's done really well has been using video again some years ago. I think this would seem, be seen as just not very practical that, for example, a person with a wheelchair would always have a camera. But of course, these days, um, I think it, it is feasible that you might have a mounted um, mobile phone and, and you could sort of record a person's mouth all the time. And if you watch uh, family members of people with this arthritis, trying to understand what is being said, they watch that person very carefully. So they, they don't just listen with their ears, they're really watching the person. So there is a lot of information in, in, the, um, in the gestures and the way that the mouth and, and the whole body is moving for sure. Uh, and as I said, sort of other um, features and representations, I vectors and various speak invariant features, again, trying to apply some of the things that we've seen working in the mainstream ASI area. 
And so, of course, deep learning um, is an obvious one to try and apply. But of course, the um, problem here is having enough data to, to use some of these um, quite data hungry techniques. So in Sheffield, we have a long line of work. Some of you will know Professor Phil Green, uh, who started a lot of this back then. I worked with him early on. So we, for example, developed um, what we call the home service system. Uh, this was before Internet of Things. So it was all based on, um, on various other technologies. And um, the idea here was that people would be given a system to use in their homes, and we would then record their interactions with the system and use that as training data. Uh, which was a nice novel idea. And it was also in the cloud, which back then was, was new. Um, as I say, using articulators again, we've um, worked um, quite a lot with that on that um, transform speech as well. And recently we've looked at emotion recognition. So um, trying to think about if people did have communication aids where they speak to and the communication aid might be re-speaking, um, would it also be possible to recognize the emotions um, that people are trying to express so that you can add that to the, to the voice? Um, and the simple answer is yes, people with dysarthria can express emotions. Um, and we had a student working on that in recent years. And so now I'm going to move on to talking about the pathology, pathology in a person's speech and language uh, and how we might go about detecting this. Um, so there's a lot of interest in general in trying to measure cognitive health um, and um, a couple of main motivations around here. So people with cognitive impairment, for example, from Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's, they often show very early signs of conditions in their speech and language. And of course, the way you use your speech and language, the way you talk uh, and the way you describe things um, is of course, totally affected by uh, the health of your brain. So if you're starting to have problems with uh, your cognition, it will show in your ability to find the right words, and putting it together, sentence, etc. Um, so if we were able to detect some of these very early signs, uh, we could, of course, improve treatment um, and save money as well as time. So a lot of, uh, certainly in the UK, when you go to your doctor with uh, memory problems and you might be worrying about having dementia, um, it might take you six months before you are assessed uh, at, at a proper clinic. So if we had an automatic test that could early on help you to understand what's going on, um, would be really um, advantageous. So there's various uh, applications. So uh, you can imagine sort of screening of the population for particular conditions. Currently, that's not um, something that people uh, working in dementia detection is necessarily interesting, interested in. So for example, at the moment we screen routinely um, all women um, older than 50 or something for breast cancer because we've got very good treatment uh, available. We currently don't have um, that much to offer people with dementia. So that's not uh, something that is currently of interest. Instead, we're interested in stratification of people with memory concerns. Uh, so working with doctors, I've learned this sort of subtle difference between this and stratification is used uh, when people are presenting with a problem. So they might go to the doctor with memory concerns. And at that stage, you need to find out what is the cause of the memory concern. It could be dementia. It could be sort of an early uh, stage of dementia called mild cognitive impairment. But it could also be you've got other problems with your memory not to do with dementia, perhaps caused by stress or anxiety or um, other things. And so it's really important early on to find out what sort of category you're in there um, so stratification is, is something we're very interested in. And the third thing is um, long-term tracking of people with mild cognitive impairments. So MCI is a sort of pre-stage um, for Alzheimer's disease uh, for many people. And, um, but not everyone who's diagnosed with MCI go on to develop Alzheimer's disease. So you can imagine if you are um, Diagnosed with MCI, it's a, it's a troubling and worrying time because you're feeling like, well, I know that in five years time, perhaps 50% um, of people with MCI will develop Alzheimer's disease. And of course you die from Alzheimer's disease. So if you could keep an eye on people and reassure people along the way and as early as possible detect when you see signs that they may be converting as it's called to, to AD. So dementia is um, what we call an umbrella term to describe uh, various conditions. So it's, it's really used to describe the symptoms. And one of the main causes of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. It accounts for 70% of the cases. 
And with um, a growing aging population across the world, not just in developing countries, um, dementia is on the rise. And in the UK and uh, in England and Wales, it's currently the, co- the leading cause of death. So above cancer, above heart disease. So that's that quite striking. Um, in terms of causes, we don't actually know for sure yet, uh, but we do know there's no single cause. There's lots of risk factors here. And so this is quite a worrying list to be reading if uh, for those of us who are not completely young anymore. So age, genetics, smoking, diet, lots of lifestyle um, areas here, not getting enough exercise, poor vascular health. Um, so for example, keeping your heart healthy is, is good. And it also affects women more than men. Uh, in terms of the sort of speech and language side of things, um, dementia, the voice quality is affected. Um, this is a very sort of small list of things. Uh, you tend to use more empty phrases. So you're able to keep a conversation going, but you might be starting to use more sort of standard phrases and um, speak in more generic terms. And you suddenly start to use less specific words. So there's been a couple of um, key um, studies um, where people have investigated sort of longitudinally um, uh, the speech and language of people who uh, went on to develop dementia. So one of them is Iris Murdoch, who's a very famous um, British author. And people studied all of her novels um, across the years. And she's a very accomplished writer. writer. But in the later uh, books, um, they found that she struggled a lot with uh, complexity. So syntactic complexity was reduced. Uh, the mean sense and length and the number of clauses. And someone told me that there had been a review of her last book and uh, one of the reviewers, not knowing that she was in the early stages of having Alzheimer's, had written, oh, it, you know, it sounds like a 12-year-old writing this. So quite damaging. So she clearly had um, early signs of, of um, being affected. And likewise, the very famous case, Ronald Reagan. So about five years out of office, he developed dementia as well, Alzheimer's. And people have been looking at his um, press conference speeches and comparing his to those of uh, George Bush. Um, And they can see with Ronald Reagan, again, he showed a sort of reduction in the number of unique words over time, uh, increasing conversational fillers, these sort of empty words and non-specific nouns. Um, Again, long, long time before um, he went, he sort of had enough uh, symptoms to go and get diagnosed. So what is currently happening when you go to the doctor? So one of the many tests that is happening is is this uh, mocha um, test. It's a simple pen and paper test. Um, You might have heard the previous president, Donald Trump, describe this test, so he aced this test. It's not a difficult test at all if you don't have any cognitive problems, but once you start having problems with your brain, some of this becomes difficult. So there is a lot of different categories that are assessing different cognitive domains. Some of this is to do with language. So you can see there's some um, memory tests for, for words, etc. And this has been translated to many different languages. So I'm sure there is a, a German equivalent as well. Um, picture description is another task that is often used. I'll show you a typical picture in a minute. Um, but there's also more sort of invasive and expensive procedures, scans, for example, uh, various blood tests, etc. So or spinal fluid tests. And... Um, Another important part is um, a whole sort of history taking conversation. So the doctor will typically sit you down perhaps with family member and sort of take you through how you are currently going about leading your life. Uh, Can you go to the shops independently? Do you manage your budgets and your money yourself? Those kind of things that will often reveal to the doctor that things are wrong. Um, One of the tests they do is what's called a fluency test. So there is a semantic and a phonemic uh, version of these. You might ask someone to name all the animals you can in uh, 60 seconds or name lang- um, words starting with a particular letter. This is surprisingly difficult even for people without cognitive impairment, so you should try one day. But for people with Alzheimer's disease, um, this is uh, very, very difficult. Um, so people have tried to look at what sort of happens, what patterns, so you can see here people kind of comparing different ways. So MCI, for example, they sort of mention quite a few um, animals here, but sort of seem to go back to some of the animals. And the person with Alzheimer's disease really managed about five different words in a, in a minute, which is uh, not a lot. And they might go back and not remember, for example, that they've said dog before. 
So we did, uh, we've done quite a lot of work on um, people describing this particular picture here. So it's from an aphasia uh, test, but it's used quite a lot in dementia detection as well. And it's one of the few um, databases to do dementia detection that's publicly available is descriptions of people who are healthy uh, versus people with Alzheimer's disease describing this picture here. And so you're basically asked to describe what you see in a picture, give as much detail as you can. It's a terribly on PC picture. So it's a, a sort of 50s mum washing up, etc. But leaving that aside, as you can see in a picture, there's lots of things happening here. And so a person without cognitive problems should be able to talk for quite some time about what's happening and perhaps also make the connection that the woman in the picture is probably the mum of the two children, that there's an accident about to happen with the sink overflowing, the a boy is stealing cookies and falling over on the stool. So lots of things happening, but people with dementia uh, may not make these connections. So for people with dementia, they will often use, um, not use the word mum, but maybe instead talk about the lady or the woman and not connecting it to the children. So these are some of the things we will look for uh, when we look at this. And so I have a student who's just about to finish her PhD. So she spent a long time looking at deep learning approaches to some of these standard tests, um, especially the, the uh, cookie theft. And one of the things she's been particularly interested in is to, of course, apply all the machine learning side of things, but also go back and look at what do clinicians do when they ask people to, to um, describe this picture? What are they then doing? So they record the description often and they go back manually to assess it. So one of the things they do is they look at um, the language at lots of different levels, so both at the word and the sentence and the whole kind of paragraph level. And so she spent a long time trying to design um, hierarchical networks that would try and capture some of this uh, to very good success. So she looked a lot on um, how she could incorporate this kind of uh, more clinician-inspired approach into the machine learning. Um, and she also looked at, um, for example, what the attention layers would tell us about the importance of different words and some of the, uh, which sort of aligned with what we knew from, from research. The other main thing I think we'd say in, in Sheffield that we've done in this area is to look for signs of dementia in conversations. So we've developed a tool uh, inspired by those kind of history taking conversations that the neurologists have, because what they were telling me was that in those five minutes where they sit the patient down, they have an initial chat, they get a very good picture of whether that person will have dementia. Of course, they have to do all of the expensive tests and what have you, but that ability of the patient to answer really simple questions like, what did you do in the weekend, uh, shows a lot because we know that keeping or having a conversation is a cognitive, very demanding thing. So we've developed this system where we record this conversation. The patient is answering questions asked by a talking head on the screen. You can see it in the bottom right there. And then we do various feature extractions um, and use machine learning to kind of classify. So we do some acoustic features and we do linguistic features and conversational features as well. So we need to do speech recognition on this as well. And there's lots of complications here, overlapping speech, um, not well-formed speech necessarily. So a lot of the things that would normally use uh, or work in the mainstream, typical ASR is, is a challenge here. And so the work really originated with um, work done where they recorded neurologists speaking to the patient. So that initial conversation and we demonstrated. So they first did a linguistic analysis by hand and found that there were particular things you could spot in the patient's conversation um, if they were people with dementia and there were things that you would spot or not have when they were healthy controls. And we then went about probably in the last six years, um, I've worked with a team and a neurologist here in the hospital to try and automate that process. So the first thing we did was to automate the doctor. So we now have this on-screen doctor that is asking questions and we then added in this pipeline we saw in the previous example. And we've developed, uh, the first thing we really did was to try and take these sort of linguistic manual features or characteristics um, on the left here. So um, you probably won't be able to read all of this, but there were about seven different things that were kind of picked out as clearly being significant in terms of discriminating between the different diagnostic classes. And we tried to translate those into what would be possible to extract um, automatically. And one of the things we've done, um, 
is that we have tried to work uh, with more realistic diagnostic classes. So we're working with conversations and we're also working with as best as possible all the different types of people that would essentially walk through the door in a neurologist's office. So some of the, there's only really one available, publicly available database, uh, Dementia Bank, which is the one with the picture descriptions before. And they've mainly got healthy controls and Alzheimer's disease. Um, and they are very different classes, which means uh, in terms of machine learning, it's not um, too difficult, a challenging problem. And in terms of clinical relevance, again, this is not the interesting thing. So the clinicians are much more interested in these borderline cases. So what we've got here um, is four main classes. So we've got the health controls in one end, and we've got the neurodegenerative, which is mostly Alzheimer's in the other end. But between those two end cases, we've got two more cases. So the functional memory disorder people, FMD, are people um, with memory problems not caused by dementia. Mm -hmm. So they are the people with anxiety and depression, et cetera. And their symptoms are very overlapping with um, some of the other groups, but it's really important that they're not set for dementia diagnosis because they need to be treated in a completely different way. Uh, and to have them wait for six months before they're then seen for expensive scans, just to be told, actually, thankfully, you don't have dementia, is not appropriate. So we really want to capture them early. And the other group is the um, mild cognitive impairment group who may go on to develop Alzheimer's disease. So again, that's a really difficult um, group to diagnose. And so we spent a lot of time looking at these two-way or three-way or four-way classifications and, and trying to improve um, proof accuracy here, looking at what different types of features are used. So we've used, uh, as I said, acoustic and text-based features um, and also conversational features in general. Uh, we've looked at the fluency test. Uh, we've looked at the answers to these questions we have. We've looked at the picture description tasks. And recently we've done a lot of work with bird-based, um, transformer-based language model, um, word embeddings. That's a really powerful uh, model in general, but it's shown to be a particularly powerful for the tasks like dementia detection. Uh, so there's been a lot of recent work in there. So there was uh, just this interview has gone uh, a new challenge called Adresso, using some of the dementia bank data, but sort of rebalanced. And um, I think we got one of the joint leads in that project. So the problem with BERT, so it's a very powerful model, isn't it? But is to use it on uh, text, which has come as the output of an ASR um, speech recognizer, because of course that's full of errors. So that's not what it's training. So we spend a bit of work trying to, to modify uh, or, or, or sort of um, post-train uh, the bird model. And we're hoping for to have a new addresser challenge um, for next into speech, where we will add some of our work, uh, our data into to that with the people in Edinburgh. Another thing we need, uh, we know that we need to address if we want to move from lab-based work and into an actual system that works in, in uh, a doctor's office is to look at things uh, like uh, detection of depression and anxiety. So they, a lot of the patients with dementia also have depression and anxiety. Sometimes the depression causes the dementia, sometimes the dementia causes the depression, sometimes they just coexist. Um, and in terms of speech and language based assessment, there's a lot of overlapping symptoms. So you really want to be able to detangle what's caused by the depression and anxiety and what's caused by the uh, dementia. And so I've had a student look at some of these, um, how you might be able to go about detecting um, dementia if you also happen to know uh, depression and anxiety scores. So we are re routinely with all of our data collection uh, with the doctors also uh, screening them for depression and anxiety. So we have this additional data. Uh, the same student actually is, is working on the not, um, not dementia detection, but sort of trying to track emotions and uh, depression and anxiety in psychotherapy sessions. So uh, we have access to some data here. Uh, we're trying to develop a big system that will um, help us sort of analyze that. So it's sort of in a similar vein in terms of um, detecting or tracking signs of uh, nonverbal um, sort of characteristics. 
And going back to the dementia detection, um, so we're hoping to commercialize this in a couple of years' time. We just had a big grant. Um, I will be looking for a postdoc if anyone's um, come to the end of their PhD quite soon. Um, so that's quite um, exciting work. So we're working closely with a company. And of course, you then have to have regulatory approval to make it a medical device to test it in clinic. Um, just a quick slide about other recent work that is happening. Um, so we're trying to take our Cochrane Speak system and, and apply it to stroke survivors. Uh, so they're often younger people who've had a stroke. Um, and what makes the language-based assessment for cognitive impairment um, difficult is that, of course, people with a stroke have got other language problems often happening, uh, hopefully improving over time. So you're sort of trying to detect signs of cognitive impairment impairment against this moving picture of um, speech impairments in general. We also are very interested in language agnostic speech analytics, uh, trying to find systems um, that works for people who are non-native English speakers. So certainly in a society like the UK, um, for this sort of system to really work in, in outside of the lab, um, that's one of the challenges to tackle. Um, of course, students is interested in fluency detection, so she's a linguist uh, in people with MCI, again, sort of particular area that uh, can help us uh, work with that particular group. Uh, another student is you're looking at detecting types of seizure, applying some of the techniques we have for um, learned from the dementia detection side. And then we've started to um, work with local um, ethnic minorities in Sheffield. We know that um, they're often less willing to come to the doctor if they have memory problems. They may not all have a full understanding of the, what dementia is. There might be some taboo around this. So there's a lot of work we need to do to make sure that they are not left behind. And finally, I've got a student who is um, doing something different to all the rest of us, so not audio or speech-based, but a video-based cognitive impairment detection. And just briefly on a little bit of a side work is, um, as I mentioned, um, work on what to do if English is not your native language. So we took the uh, Cochrane Speak or Digital Doctor System to Kenya and worked with local uh, neurologists there. Um, we had a Swahili version. And we also had a version that was speaking with uh, the sort of English accent they have there. And we're working with this local um, action group as well to, to make uh, a system like Cochrane Speak more accessible to them and appropriate, if you like. Um, and then finally, I just want to talk a little bit about how we do better research in the healthcare domains. I know a lot of you will be working on this. So these are kind of main challenges slash top tips. Um, so I think it's really important that we constantly try and think about how we take the systems we've developed in the lab, but think about how we make them useful and useful to people so all the time. Um, bear in mind that this is going to have impact, hopefully. And to do that, you really want to work closely, if you can, with the main stakeholders, so potentially end users, but also their carers, clinicians, for sure. Um, we've done a lot of co-design workshops along the way. Um, I can't stress enough how important it is as, for us as engineers not to assume we know what people want or what people can work out how to, to do on a computer screen, for example. It's really important to get input and all of the workshops we've had, I've been the sort of computer scientist in the room and I've learned something every single time. Um, so they're so valuable for everyone. Um, and related to that, repeatedly evaluate your technology, both qualitatively and quantitatively. And uh, the top tips uh, related to this, work closely with clinicians if at all possible. Not only are they an excellent source of uh, valuable data, uh, but they also have that extra insight about what's really possible in real life, if you like. Um, embrace the sort of multidisciplinary aspects of various projects. It's uh, incredibly challenging, uh, but also in incredibly enriching. Um, and just a small thing, since we're working with speech and language, be careful with your own language. So um, the word normal, I, I think, should be discouraged. So use typical. Patient, be careful about using that. Not everyone we work with are patients necessarily. Uh, suffer from, I, I find it difficult as well. So uh, we don't know what other people suffer from, but you can say things like they're living with dementia, for example. Uh, and often there's a little bit of debate about whether you put um, the describer before. So here you might say dysarthric speaker, but I think it's better to say speaker with dysarthria. So that the fact that they have dysarthric speech doesn't become the sort of overall defining aspect of them. 
uh, and then, of course, embrace and enjoy the challenges. Um, so that's the end of my speech. Um, this is my tea. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to try and see if I can work out how to not share anymore. Hi, Deep. Thank you very much for this presentation. This was really great and I enjoyed it a lot. And I have a round of applause for you that I hope you can hear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, great talk. I enjoyed uh, already some parts on, on Interspeech. And I must admit, the, the work that you're doing here is really awesome. And the results that you're presenting, and it's just a fabulous overview to, to get on the field. So I haven't been working in, in this for many years. And I enjoyed your presentation so much because it gave me a chance to connect um, with the latest developments really quickly. So I personally, I'm completely stunned by this talk. It's really great. So it must have been a lot of work to prepare such a survey talk. So it's really cool. Um, I think, in particular, the points that you highlighted in the end in working in a clinical setting are really, really important, that you really look at how the, how the tests are done, how the, the clinicians work uh, in their environment. And I think that's, that's something that everybody working in this direction absolutely has to, to internalize. So I'm completely, uh, would, um, I completely follow what you put on, on the last couple of slides. Brings me to the question is, how, how close are we to using these methods in routine clinical use? Is, is it routine clinical use? Is it being reimbursed by insurance companies? How close are we there? Yeah, not at the moment. There are companies working in, um, in sort of language-based, um, for example, dementia detection, and we are working with a company there and hoping we will probably in three years' time have something that's available of course, then it's another five years to really test it and evaluate it. And it takes a long time to build up the evidence. Um, I think the, it's definitely feasible. So that's a good step to um, to get to, I think. Um, I think it's just the, the challenges is all the kind of all the cases. How do you deal with, I don't know, the noise background in a doctor's office? All of these things we don't have when we're working with things in the labs. So and there's lots of challenges to overcome, even if at the core the technology works. Um, and just, you know, how is it all set up? You don't want to propose something that causes a lot of extra work to the doctor. They need to trust the results they see as well. So there's a lot of work, I think, uh, again, making it useful. Um, for the doctors, which isn't necessarily to do with the machine learning itself. Exactly. In particular, I found that in a lot of clinical sites, acoustic um, conditions were very challenging. Yeah. So do, do you have some ideas how, how to deal with that? Are there standard approaches in, that are already out there that we can just adopt? Or do we need something something else to cope? Yeah, there's lots of different aspects to this. So a lot of, um, they're often very harsh acoustic environments. So a lot of our data have got like, you know, it would be recorded in, in a clinic room in a hospital. There's hard flooring, hard walls, doors slamming all the time. It's quite a noisy environment. Um, and of course, there are kind of noise reduction techniques to deal with some of that. I also feel that we've tried to do a lot of work really explaining to the people who are managing the recording. Mm -hmm what's important um so avoid for example having lots of people talking in the background um often we've had to be quite um specific about for example so often people will bring in uh, their husband or wife or an, an or sort of a, an old uh, adult child to instruct them not to for example take part in the test so they're so used at this stage to help for example their old mum who's struggling and so they'll say oh come on mum you can remember another word and we're like oh sh sh. you know we can't have and um, so there's all of these things to try and and avoid some of the noise that you might normally have by instructing the people who are managing the recording in terms of what's important and it, i think that's again translating what for us is what is the data that we're really interested in and so for us it's much more important that you might see um, the mum struggle to find the word rather than that she's helped by her daughter to find a word for, or find say dog or something like this so it's it's um communicating i think what's important to us in terms of the recording mm -hmm. Yeah, I found that most of uh, speech and language therapists, they have also very good ears. So they have um, a good understanding what is a, a problem for the recording and what isn't. Yeah. 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 
so in, in, in these settings, I had very good experiences. But if you really go, I mean, stroke, if you think of a acute application, then you're essentially at the bedside. Yeah. Or yeah, if yeah, you yeah. think of long term follow up, then you have to have devices that are used at home. Yeah. So, do, do, do so this, that's the system we're developing, we're hoping to use at home. But of course, that introduces lots of extra complications because um, these are all people to start with and not necessarily very IT savvy. So they might sort of, oh, I can't do the tests on until my daughter comes home, or I can't work out, or oh, I lost the link I clicked on in the email, or all sorts of things goes wrong, or they hold them off my phone in a really um, bad way. Or um, So again, there's lots of, if they're doing it on their own, you have to have a lot in the software that really makes sure, make, make sure that the recording is high, as high quality as possible. Um, so that's sort of uh, the company we're working with is, is sort of talking about an onboarding experience, almost like you, you know, playing a game, computer game. This is sort of initial tutorial to really get you sort of set up with the skills you need. So again, there's a similar kind of thing there. So again, not something we as machine learning AI uh, specialists would necessarily know, but of course they are experts in, in kind of human computer interaction. So they'll know all of, of that side of things. Absolutely. I mean, there's also something you already emphasized in your talk that this is really important that it's appealing, easy to use and so yeah. on. So I think that will be, uh, although it, we like the technology and uh, really, I mean, what you showed are really wonderful results. And it looks like we're very close to putting this into practice. And then there's all these tiny little challenges that then you realize that it's not as, as you expected it to be. Do you do you have some ideas how to deal with the problem that there is so little um, pathological data out there? Um, yeah, I I hope over time we'll all be better at trying our best to. Um, I mean, the, the core certainly in the UK, the core barrier is the ethics applications, and so a lot of our data we um, don't have permission to share, and, and we're ho really hoping that that could help. And I think there are there's lots of work on developing platforms, for example, where you can have things that you can process data without the data leaving a particular country, for example. So there has been efforts to do that. Um, a lot of the data we record is not necessarily, um, hasn't necessarily got a lot of personal information, mm -hmm. but still, of course, it's sensitive. Speech is sensitive, isn't it? Because if you know the person, you can recognize the person. And I know there's a lot of work as well on trying to anonymize speech. But yeah, then, of course, you might lose all of the um the work um yeah i think um your talk when you came to sheffield i had lots of my students afterwards yes, saying, oh, really yes. in this particular aspect what do you think Heidi? um so it's, you know that's that's and if, i've been thinking about this discussion uh, yeah. a lot since then and the, there's the one key question is is it actually possible to anonymize um pathological speech i mean even if you get rid of some of the voice characteristics and you don't hear it anymore the pathology itself like the first case that you've shown if you if you know that person even if you change the voice the way the person is speaking is probably a biometric but i mean i haven't results about that but i would assume that it is the pausing and the stress information and all of those things so if you go about changing that you might as well re-speak it i think yeah. um, so, so you you probably have to merge different speakers somehow uh, in order to read yeah yeah i mean yeah. Li like you do in the statistics right that you need at least like three persons and that you somehow merged or compute higher order statistics off that they're really anonymized yeah. that's interesting I, I really like the efforts with the challenges. I think this is also a, a great thing of, of yeah. pushing the field ahead. The, this is... I think that's an area where we know from other uh, areas. So Sheffield has been key in developing some of the main challenges in, in other areas, and it's really boosting the research, isn't it? And so I think um, if we could do something similar in, in this area, it would be really good. I mean, I wish someone like Google would release their data, but I don't think that's going to happen for the dysarthric speech recognition. But I think one of the things that we could do is, uh, and we talked about this with the dresser, is to release protocols or recipes for how you might go about, or even software for recording, for example, picture description from all over the world. And then you would have, you know, you can imagine people contributing and even, you know, off the shelf laptops that have got okay microphones these days. So you don't need expensive equipment. So it makes it easier, I think, to collect data and, and 
mm-hmm. distributed. And pink descriptions say, uh, apart from the fact that you can recognize the person from the voice, but there's no personal information in there. Do, do you think a concept like data donation could work? Yeah, so that's what Google is doing. Um, I mean, in our experience with, for example, people with dysarthria, they, um, it works better if you have a personal connection. So, for example, so rather than I don't know, putting on Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter or we're collecting data, you get very little response. Mm. So I think that if you have a speech therapist or people working in assistive technology, that can encourage them to take part. So that is a much higher uptake rate, I think. Absolutely. Um, that might change as well as, as, you know, people are younger people kind of, you know, young people these days are so used to technology and social media, et cetera. So um, maybe that is different from the last 10, what it was 10 years ago. Hmm. Yeah, so nowadays people share all kinds of things on social media and you're sometimes surprised what you can. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Heidi, I enjoyed your presentation a lot. I think this is really excellent work that you're doing. It was such a great overview of the uh, over the field. And thank you very much for coming here and doing this presentation. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I have another round of applause. The typical knocking on the table. Oh, yeah. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. The German lecture room. Please <laughs> don't recommend it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you can see that we had an exciting presentation, really many things that have been covered from the entire field of speech and language pathological assessment over a long period of time. So I really enjoyed the presentation. I can really recommend it to everybody and I hope you enjoyed the presentation as much as I did. Obviously, if you have questions, you can contact us, you can post in the comments, you can also contact us on Twitter or other social media channels. And I'm very much hoping that we'll see again in another episode of Beyond the Patterns. <laughs>